Hello and good evening to all of you Westmarch workshoppers out there. This is Leviathan, and yes, I am back. I'm sorry that I missed you on the last episode. I really hope you enjoyed Nine Ball's intimate evening with Wolfcrier. Both amazing people, of course, and I am sad that I didn't get to talk to Wolfcrier. Hopefully we'll be able to redo that one in the future. I always seem to miss the interview somehow. But in any case, you are hearing only my voice currently because Nineball is off gallivanting, his hard work has paid off, and he's enjoying his company's holiday party tonight. So he will not be joining us, but I am not going to ride solo because, you know, the best way to gain experience and to have a good time with Diablo is in a party. Am I right or am I right? So without further ado, we're kicking off episode 130, West March Workshop Winter Wonderland. All the W's. And I got my good friend with me, Dread Scythe. Dread, what's going on, man? Thank you for joining me and stepping in to fill those uh, nine ball shoes. <laughs> oh, it's all going good. How are you? Good, man. I'm glad to be back. We are doing the episode that will air uh, before the holidays. Technically, Hanukkah was yesterday, as we were just discussing before the show started. And then Christmas is coming up in a couple of weeks here, so... Get festive, huh? Where's your uh, where's your Hanukkah hat? Oh, all the all the decorations from the tree to the lights inside and outside are all downstairs. So <laughs> the bedroom is a holiday free zone. Holiday free. <laughs> yeah, I'm forcing my beliefs on everyone with my Santa hat right here. Uh, in fact, uh, Alyssa got a hat. She's probably wearing it right now. Ah, well, if she does a little cameo in the background, then you'll be 100% more festive. Oh, we'll we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> she she brought her. I I was going to help, but then she was like, "No, I'm taking my laptop. I'm going all by myself." I'm like, "Okay, oh, good night. I'll that. let you know what I'm done." <laughs> <laughs> You'll return to her soon. Uh, so, man, it's been a little bit of a while since we had you on the show. I think the last one was for the season wrap up for season eleven. How has your weeks, months in gaming been? I've actually been hanging out with you a little bit this season, oddly I enough. I know, we've been like like borderline gaming buddies this like <laughs> past, what, four weeks this season is? Thickest Thieves, yeah, man. Or is it four weeks? Five weeks tomorrow. Five weeks tomorrow, yeah. yeah. Um, no, it's actually been really good playing with you. Oh god, you're a machine. <laughs> the, the rumors are true. Levi is a machine. Does not compute. He, he, he's advanced AI. Uh, he is he is the first neural network sent back in time. He is the original Terminator. Okay, I'll stop. I'll stop. Um, no, it's actually been really good. Um, I think we all had indications of what this season was going to be like. Oh, you know, all the sets are balanced. You, know, you can play what you want. You know, kind of like you know, almost like a pseudo hippie vibe to it. Like, yeah, play what you want. Be <laughs> do do what you want, man. Whatever. Free love. And then every and then you knew this season was going to be different because people were like no like seriously like i have like 90 level gems like should i augment them it's like well what grs are you doing like i'm doing like 95s but like i've never been this high before but should i it's like all like all those kind of weird questions like yeah like shouldn't you know the answer to this and then you realize these are all the people who were those pseudo casuals who are now entering the realm of the higher level players and you're like oh this patch did work like it really did work and it, it really has because i mean i i don't want to make a laundry list of it all but like i've beaten so many past seasonal records it's silly uh i hit 1308 paragon yesterday in the group review very nice so that's definitely my highest by far by like hundreds like at least 200 i think the highest i ever got in season was maybe like 1058 somewhere around there oh and so that you was blew it out of the water seasons. yeah that was multiple seasons ago nice. i think that was the second season i played as a monk baby season six um so that was like you know paragon which is a weird measure of things but I, it is what it is of course and then uh i got i have a gr 103 underneath my belt um i'm gonna try to push out i don't know if a 110 is gonna be viable but with like keep on pushing keep on being at least somewhat steady and consistent it may be attainable through paragon and just augmenting my towels build with you know level 100 level 105 augments and just fishing 
fishing. Yeah. Fishing. There's always um, fishing. So you think you're going to push it with Tals? I've been hearing Firebirds and even DMO are both high contenders up there. Uh, DMO is... is uh, DMO, when I look at it, uh, not to go too much off tangent, is kind of like Twister build. It's very affix specific. It's okay. kind of like Kidem. Like, like you need all that cooldown in all these slots, and it needs to be like perfect rolls. So it's kind of a pain in the ass. I see what you gather all that gear. Uh, I will say Firebirds does have the damage potential, but I actually took all my Firebird pieces for like uh, 45 minutes and I assembled what I had. And I was able to get up to like 3.2 mil sheet damage and I had a decent amount of toughness and everything. Everything was balanced. It was all like weird. Like, you know, this has no armor and this has no resist. And I wasn't, it was actually, it's a rather balanced set. And I tried playing it. Oh my god, I was dying left and right. Oh like, really? I did in my nineties, but I went from like I think I died like ten times in the GR. <laughs> so I'm like, uh I'll just stick with Tao. So I'll be one of those I need my shields on shields on shields kind of personality, but at least I can I know what I'm doing. I mean it does fit into the same narrative that we were just harping on in. You know, you can do whatever you want though. You'll still be able to run your Tals even if it proves to somehow in the spectrum of wizard offerings be maybe one of the lesser builds you probably still will be able to get close to or attain your goals just because of how much diversity was given with all the buffs to these sets right oh yeah i mean i mean do you i mean ugh, of all things like veers is um it, like i love veers with archon that's because i've been playing three seasons of Wizard Archon, so there's probably a little bit of that mixed in. <laughs> uh, but there's, then there's also like the weird Fakak, Veer's Arcane, uh, no, Frozen Orb build, which uses Archon the as many sex as possible, so you have the, so you're powering up your Frozen Orb. So you're actually not using Archon for Archon, you're using Archon as, as a rotational like it's like a clockwork um, buffing cycle that's tied to COE. Okay. So as uh, SVR uh, was basically explaining it, it's like you have this many rotations of COE in a, in a in a greater rift, and you have this many opportunities to power it up with this many average Archon stacks. This is how much damage you do. So your so your damage and what you're able to do is almost pre-calculated for you in a way if you actually like go the d3 planner and you know figure out your damage and run it right. through the numbers and and you know depending on how lucky you were with pylons and elite packs and grouping but it, it, it's very like, uh, and it's so weird going from a dh to wizard where dh was like oh impale uh cold or lightning and then ue fire ue grenades fire uh marauders fire so that's like five builds <laughs> and then it's like wizards like oh there's like a dozen builds pick one like uh like eyes wide open what the hell am i doing uh like i'm not used to this kind of sure. uh diversity and it, some of it's nuanced some of it is very major some of it is uh just in the play style so there's been a lot to learn but there's also a lot to love uh, i guess just to kind of finish up it uh what i've done i'm also trying to uh, master all the wizard set dungeons, you know, kind of put a little cherry on top, as well as getting, hopefully trying to get the 110, and uh, Paragon, it would be interesting if I could lapse my non-season, which is 1423, I think. Oh, you should be able so, to do that. Yeah, so it would be, you know, lapse my non-season, and then shoot for 1500 at that point, and I, you know, while I'm at it, get Guardian, because why not? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, just really, like, really spike like every major accomplishment you try to do. Sure. But I've talked enough. How was your week spent? <laughs> no, that all sounds good, man. I wish you the best of luck. Of course, we'll probably still be partied up, so I'll have really mm -hmm. uh, close tabs on how your progress is going. Uh, for me, oh, yeah. it's, you know, it's been... Oh, yeah, just so you know, uh, I still have over 100 keys. Of course you do. Yeah. <laughs> That's one of the themes of the season is Dread doesn't stop farming keys ever. Even though I tell him that at some point you should probably use the keys because they don't do anything for you until you actually open them for greater rifts. But in any case, um, 
Yeah, it's been a fun season, honestly. It's been, I guess, about a month since I was last on the show, which is essentially the whole season, like we're saying, five weeks of it uh, starting tomorrow. So the Crusader has been a really fun thing to return to. I still remember all the joy that I had when I was playing Condemn in Season 1 and Season 2. Only marred, I, and I have to always bring it back up because, man, it grinded my gear so badly, but only marred by that mid-season slash late-season patch in Season 1. But Condemn, is, it's been such a blast. And it's weird to see it be so widely regarded by the entire community. Even when Crusader did have Condemn as its best build, it was still kind of like a niche class because mm -hmm. it was the new kid on the block. You know, first season was August and then the uh, expansion had just released in March of the same year. So people were getting acclimated to it, but n no one was really looking to, to be the top Crusader, I don't think. So it was still kind of in its own basket of here's what we do over here. And now it's why, like, everyone is like, why is Condemn so good? How do the Condemn mechanics work? Like, it's this almost renaissance of people discovering that the Crusader is actually a good class, a powerful class. So it's been cool where's, to kind of lead the charge. This knowledge been all my life? Right? It's like the you, knowledge. you weren't an OG, apparently. <laughs> you can definitely tell some of the uh, bandwagoners from the original Crusaders because there are certainly... I would say there's a bit of a skill gap in terms of those who've been on Crusader for a decent amount and understanding how important things like CDR, um, CDR management in terms of activating skills and stuff is to the class and a, a whole bunch of things that probably people do actually want to know about but we're not going to go too long on on the podcast. Um, but just all that aside, I think it's been really fun to sort of dig back into the education mode of, you know, Leviathan teaches Crusader while trying to stream it. And I love, I love how it's been going so far. A lot of really great people stopping into the stream um, and being part of the season too. I've been grouping with a decent amount of the community and oftentimes other Crusaders, which has been really cool. And I haven't been able to share any gear because Dread, let me tell you, my RNG this season is god awful. <laughs> that has to be a trail. Your RNG can be god awful, but hey, at least you don't have to farm the gear because you're playing software, right? <laughs> oh, oh. Maybe that oh, is my punishment. It's, hey, uh, welcome back to softcore, but by the way, since you're not dying, we're not going to give you all the GG drops. <laughs> at least not early <laughs> on in the season. No, it's oh, been... Oh. If I can make a small, small um, observation is I would like to point out that I resisted the Church of West long enough for both you and Nineball to come back to Softcore. I know there were, you know, circumstances, but I just want to make that pointed out. I resisted the Church of uh, West. I don't think this is anything to brag about. This is something you should feel shame for. <laughs> We've been gone and came back. And you still haven't changed your ways. We, we learned to acquiesce and gain the knowledge elsewhere to round out our Diablo selves. And you're still denying yourself the, the whole other half of the game. In any case... Oh, I'm a denier. Well, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I'm a non-believer. I'm a non-believer. <laughs> Listen, hardcore warming is real, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's, uh, it's just a, it's a fun thing to be very frustrated by drops even though the drops like you said remain forever uh the gloves is the slot that really is eluding me i don't know if any other crusader out there listening can relate but gloves are tough because you do have to get cdr on there and you're still looking for your typical damage stats critical hit chance critical hit damage and getting all those together with good rolls on them unless it's going to be a primal is damn near impossible at least for me anyways this season <laughs> and I see Disco in the chat, one of the other uh, streamers who is also doing some Crusader stuff this season, also agreeing that Akon Don't gloves are cursed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you, man. The struggle is real. So it's been it's been a bit of a, a mixed bag. Definitely been having a lot of fun. Been gaining a lot of Paragon. I think I'm over 1600 right now, which is nearing already my seasonal best from previous seasons, which was season 10 when we were grouped in four player all day long in hardcore. Uh, that was 1,900 mm -hmm. plus, and so I'm definitely aiming to go at least to 2k this season, hopefully beyond. And this is without doing the rat runs, like our group has really just been kind of putting a hodgepodge of, we call it, you know, the homeless meta, the non-meta meta, we have a million <laughs> names for it, but really just doing the same... The, uh, I have no bats meta. <laughs> yeah, dude, doing the same thing that we've been harping on, which is whatever you want. So we take whoever we can get, 
sometimes we don't have a support <laughs> we just roll through anyway but oh, it's that's been rough. it's been doing? yeah you can make it happen uh if with enough tenacity and maybe some deaths along the way so it's been yeah. fun it's been cool to to experiment a little bit get out of the mindset of being super super hardcore super duper efficient even though i still try to drive our party in that direction yeah yeah dread has no comment <laughs> Uh, but well, I've, I've, I will say this much: I've got into the habit on after the first and second run of just looking at my stash and going, "Okay, repair, salvage your blues and yellows real quick. What in here will I never care if it rolls primal?" And I'm like, "Oh, this is garbage. This is garbage." I call it blind salvaging because I just don't care about the <laughs> item. Like the item, I will like never use it ever. And I just do that, just so I don't have to pick up items or have like five items on the floor in the third run. Because when we're running 90s, you know, it's a good chance that well, no items. But now we're running like 95s or 99s, so it's like, yeah, there's gonna be like 16 items on the ground on the third run. Like, I need the blind sound. Yeah, no, it it matters. It definitely makes a difference. Um, so just to round out uh, like personal accomplishments, oh, I guess also some shout outs too. Shout outs to Shepard, who's been running with us quite a bit. Um, Tuba Hero, who's in the clan, has also been running with us quite a bit. Uh, recently, Ocean, who's another crusader, has been stepping up. We ran a lot with Corey, who we haven't seen in a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think he's a student, so it's probably a exam crunch time. We could definitely talk about seasonal numbers and player base and stuff, because that's certainly a thing that's happening right now. Um, and I'm, I'm, I almost shouldn't have gone down this road because I'm certainly forgetting other people that we've been playing a decent amount with. But it's been, it's been great to. Kind of have that nice uh, cadre of people to pull from, and all mostly clan members too. Uh, really mm -hmm. exciting to see the activity and have everyone kind of reaching their own goals and stuff. I just recently, yeah. go ahead, sorry. No, I'll say just uh, yeah, it was, it was, it's been really cool to play with you, but also play with you know like Shepherd and Knight, and uh, I think Mark's been in there a little bit. But the, like those are people I usually play with. But the kind of you know, rope them into playing into the the Levi meta. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's definitely and, uh, a few different. It, it actually has been really good that we haven't had to look outside of the clan. That like the clan is there, it's it's full, and we really do group together. So we're, we're the clan is serving its purpose. Definitely, definitely. Could always be better. <clears throat> clan features, please. But it's good. <laughs> it's definitely good. Mm -hmm. uh, I also wanted to give a shout out to the other side of um, the clan too, who've been doing more of the true meta stuff. Nod Nodulogilus, which I'm probably butchering his name, Flailed, and oh goodness, Zensai. Uh, I've been taking Chris Card's spot in their group, who is their witch doctor for trash killing. And it's been interesting to kind of slot the Crusader into a pretty much meta setup of like the Z-Barb, the Z-Monk, and the Pestilence uh, Necromancer. And so far on that, we pushed uh, 115, which isn't anything to write home about, but just kind of cool to be able to do that level of Greater Rift and, you know, still have a Crusader mixed in. And mm -hmm. I think we can go further. Like, I haven't even optimized for groups at all because, again, drops aren't happening. Um, but that's something I hope to experiment a little bit more with with them. And then on the solo side, just to fully wrap it up, I just did a Greater Rift 110 on Monday or Sunday. I think it was Sunday night, which is really cool because that was kind of my seasonal goal. Uh, wanting to get that high and now the rest is cake. I actually was running just before we started the podcast a couple of 111 attempts I got a 1502 Ugh. And I screwed it up so badly too. I did not play well, but I have a bunch of excuses. My hands are cold I just come home. I was tired. I wasn't yeah, so anyways, I will get it though I will get it. I'm, I'm pumped to keep moving forward and see how it goes. So that's pretty mm -hmm. much it. That's season 12 in a nutshell for us so far, and I think what we can do now is sort of branch outward more, speak in a general sense of season 12. I want to grasp what your feeling is in terms of maybe the diversity, because you know, you are going to put together these uh, power listings and these graphs and stuff at the end of the season, oh but just what you've <laughs> seen across, and you know, those numbers are going to look crazy, but what you've seen so far maybe in you know, personal perusing of the boards, are you surprised by any particular classes advancements or maybe not as good advancements? Like a lot of people are saying maybe DH and Witch Doctor seem to be lagging behind just in terms of what they've cleared solo yeah, so far. Um 
I guess from just general overview, I mean, through our groupings, through seeing other people, through uh, watching Adam, hi Adam, uh, watching SVR, Blood, you know, all those guys, Riker, uh, seeing what they're what they're talking about, also what we're also noticing through like you know top twenty five analysts. Uh, now that we're about a month in, you know, it's kind of it's it, it's. I guess appropriate, is, for lack of a better term, to like, just say like one month in and two months in, and then, you know, at the end. Um, yeah, I would say it seems like DHs and Wish Doctors are kind of relaxing a little bit. Um, unless I'm mistaken, even though Necromancers are in there for the rat runs, and that's a popular thing, um, I don't, I, I think it's kind of. I don't know how many people are actually playing Necros to play Necros. Hmm. Um, I th whereas I think a lot of people are playing monks to play monks that can, because they can actually do solo content high now. Right. Uh, but they're also very good for the meta. So I think any class this patch that can actually do solo content high wise and can slot itself into the meta like the Crusader and Condemn build, if you can get to trash, even a 115 doesn't sound like that high compared to where the meta is. That's getting you at least 110 augments easy, 115, 116 if you really do quick runs and you really go with those, we'll say 60% chances, but they're really like 30 <laughs> with the way they're given out. Sure. Um, rolls, you can still get a really good Condemn build and have like 115 augments and everything and really push yourself solo so any so i was just continuing any class that can slot itself into the meta or is already part of the meta plus has a good one or two uh solid build for solo pusher i think it's going to excel this patch which isn't really different than any other patch cycle is that that this cycle there's such an abundance like i'm running the group builds well, i mean we're running 99s because of the way the upgrading mechanic works so essentially running hundreds right. i wouldn't have been able to do that last patch but you don't see demon hunters really at all in four players i mean wish doctors are in there but they can be replaced so easily by wish doc um necromancers sorry. right um so yeah i think there's going to be a lot of shifting like i'm imagining the graphs that i have being all nice and neat and then it's going to be like spaghetti fun <laughs> at the end of this season with like where all the classes have gone and the so way all I, the information is going to be uh, skewed. I think you make a great point. It's something maybe people aren't quite keying in on just yet is that there are these crossovers of people who are especially trying to be really efficient are probably playing things that they don't want to play. And I think when you talk about the rat runs and for people who aren't um, well informed on those, a rat run consists of a four-player group that's doing really fast greater rifts. We're talking like two to three minute clears. Uh, you have two Rathmas Necros that are using the Singularity Skeletal Mages, and they're just making you know the biggest, baddest Singularity Mages they can make to clear the rift as quickly as possible. And that's supported by a Z Barb and a Z Necromancer. And Necromancer creates the Health Globes with Land of the Dead, um, which they pretty much have 100% uptime on. And then the barb is a pickup radius barb, which is legit just there to make sure that the necros don't get, you know, flung around by uh, fixes from the elites. So, you know, always constant uptime on ignore pain. And then it's picking up every single health globe they can find since those Rathma necromancers have reapers wraps on. They're going to get that essence back and just keep pushing out badass skeletal mages. So these runs go insanely fast in really high level greater rifts too. Well, you know, what yeah. used to be considered high, but people are running like 105 greater rifts in two to three to four minutes. Like this is ridiculously it's, unheard it's of speed. Nutty. Yeah. It's nutty to watch them. Like, like you, you don't watch them. You're just kind of in like a, a prolonged sense of amazement that is happening. And it's, then you, you're like, I want to do that. Yeah, it, it looks <laughs> really sick from the outside in because they're just speed. At first you see it and it's like, you know, the little bit of progress, a little progress. You're like, okay, this doesn't look that great. And then once it all just kind of sets up and they zoom, just the progress bar. You just watch, don't even watch the clear. Watch the, the purple and it just goes, 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 goes. And then the guardian comes up and it just, you know, essentially gets one shot. But when you have 20 
uh, skeletal mages targeting that one single target. Disgusting. So yeah, it's uh, very, very effective. And this is what people are using from pretty much day one of the season to get mm -hmm. their experience. But you're right in that maybe some of the witch doctors are hidden within that necromancer and they're playing an intelligence class so they don't feel that bad not working on their witch doctor because they're probably going to have some shared drops maybe jewelry things like that and then they can yeah. also go and you know run all the bounties and such get the witch doctor gear to some base level and then try to reforge a bunch to then push on that witch doctor they'll have all their augment gems ready they'll have the paragon certainly ready and that's maybe why you're just not seeing them yet and also since people may not necessarily transition away from those experience runs until the very end of the season then they're also not working on four player stuff so maybe again that's why you're not seeing as many witch doctors who are in the four player meta you know the true version of it as that trash clerk with eric here firebat so I, I do agree with you i think if you're not finding a spot in what the most popular comps are then maybe that's why your clears aren't represented as high and they're starting to move up there though like i saw I think I can't recall if it was non-seasonal or seasonal because I just saw the Reddit post, but there was like a 116 on the Demon Hunter with uh, Marauders, just pure M6. There have been a lot of uh, Nat 6 Marauders 4 pushes, and those are starting to get to the 110 plus range. So I mean, there, people are doing things. It's just you know they didn't skyrocket off as quickly as some of the other classes like Necro and Crusader and Wizard did. So uh, it's certainly something to keep an eye on. And I think one thing to use as a resource too, you know, we have our good friend Riker who does some excellent work out there in the YouTubes. Yeah, definitely. Check out his um, tier list, which he just recently revised a couple weeks ago for some of the up and coming builds that are taking over the top of the leaderboards. And you can get a good sense of kind of what to use, which depending on which class you're on, or even just if you want general information of how each class is doing, it's something to definitely check out and keep an eye on that's over at his youtube you know just type Riker. you know the name i'm sure if you're listening to this you know who Riker is um i wanted to ask you though as a wizard are you finding that your builds you know at this point and i think you do this as much as i do we kind of diversify even within our own setups of here's my speed t13 here's my speed greater rift here's my pushing greater rift are you finding that there's a lot of difference between what you're using or is it really just like one set one build to rule it all um like the first two to three weeks there was and it's not because there isn't diversity <laughs> I'm actually realizing now that a lot of the sets are more useful and they all have their defined purpose. Having five safe sets in the armory isn't enough. Yeah, <laughs> no. I agree. So I have a speed uh, veers with average band, you know, Boon of Hoarder and M's, you know, and that set is really, that set is really strong. And I usually don't have too much issues with uh, engine you know, keeping that maintained, mm -hmm. unless it's that stupid Shadow Moors map. Yes, Shrouded Moor is still horrible. I mean, by the way, that map. Is, and ironically, that map is only good with the new mobs, which don't give that much progression. <laughs> so it's still kind of like a half slap in the face. But moving along, <laughs> um, so I have that as my first one, and then I have like a Tal's. T13, which is essentially taking out the Death Wish for a uh, Ether Walker. So I could I could basically do bounties quick, but it's with Tal, so I know if that time I won't die with uh, getting pulls throughout bounties. Nice. And then I have the solo build Tal's and the group uh, build, which is essentially the difference between a Unity and a really well rode Stone of Jordan for the group. That's at some point having a Unity point. And then I tried experimenting with Firebirds, and I was feeling amazingly today. <laughs> I'm going, how do people use this? I look at Adams, not because he's only fat. Um, 110, I'm going, I, I play the same build he has. I'm looking at it. I think I understand it, and I'm tight. It's like my wizard, like, reses, goes off, meteor reses because of the Firebird proc, and then dies again. It, it was like, no, nope, go back to Talos. That's what I'm good at. That's what I can do. I'll do Tals. <laughs> um, I would like to try DMO. I did try it with Twister Wizard in the day, so I and I have used it otherwise. So I know how the journal build works. Uh, 
essentially. So, I mean, the only real difference is it's been buffed, and they've done a couple of tweaks to how certain buffs apply. It's a little bit easier to work around. Uh, it would be nice at the end of the season, you know, just to play around with it, you know, just to do it. Sure. And again, if I want to master old four set dungeons, I'm gonna kind of have to, right? Uh, at least for five minutes <laughs> to do the if set that. dungeon. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's been great. Re- basically rediscovering all the uh, wizard uh, sets and replaying them, and falling back in love with wizard once again. Now not playing DH for the sixth season in a row. <laughs> um, it's been nice not having the figure okay is this season is it going to be carly's point which is not going to drop or is it going to be the strong arm bracers that aren't going to drop and yes holy points are just going to be a pain in my ass no matter what so i'm not going to ask so it's, it's been nice playing them and rng sorry has been kind of nice on my end i'm still kind of peeved that that primal zodiac ring i salvaged before i um no all, all the builds have been generally good and had the purpose i again just need more tabs you know <laughs> we, we need we need to buy more tabs for our stash we need to buy more tabs for our armory blizzard there's so much money on the table <laughs> all the tabs uh I, yeah the reason i was asking is because if you look across the board some classes have it better than well it depends on, i guess on what you consider to be better or worse but some classes i would say in quotes have it better than others because you might just need one set and you're good. When I look at the Crusader and the things that I've been setting up, I have my Condemn version for T13, which just swaps a few skills mm-hmm. and a few uh, cube things. Then I have Bounties, which really just swaps like the weapon in the cube. And then I have uh, Greater Rift for speeds, and I'm mostly swapping some skills and a little bit of gear. Uh, and then I have my High Pushing, and that's also Condemn. And I like only change a few things from the group stuff to the uh, High Push stuff. So it's literally just one set to rule it all. Like, you know how some people wouldn't even necessarily augment their speed setup until they're you know, far along into the season and they have like a bank of augment gems and stuff and maybe their first round has gone to whatever farming for speed GRs that they're working on. But usually there was like a thing that was good for that and then another thing that was going to be your speed you know t13s or something but like my t13 stuff is augmented because it's the (laughs) same as my pushing stuff so it's been a really weird experience i feel like uh monks kind of experience the same thing because wave of light just does it all does the high clears does the fast t13s probably using it in bounties too um you kind of have similar ish things for demon hunters depends on if you're trying to push with multi-shot which i don't think I, i haven't seen it in the leaderboards as much as I thought I would have, so it doesn't seem to be popular. The early thing that took the boards was Shadows, and then we saw the mm-hmm. influx of the N6, M4, and who knows what we'll see next. Maybe the M6 just full, um, full on, well, I can't even think what those things are called. Sentries, just sentries everywhere. So you know, I, the, you know the things that fire, that act as a sentry, there we go. Yeah, <laughs> those things. So it's kind of it's kind of intriguing that, you know, some classes have to field these multiple builds in multiple sets some you can just stick to one some are just you know a mix of 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 things and i think it's uh i think it's in a good place though i would say even like you just mentioned if you do only have one build or you know one set that's kind of guiding our choices there is still so much tweaking and minutia that you can do that you have those five different save sets in the armory and then you're kind of wishing you had a sixth or a seventh even uh, so it's really, I think, it, another good symptom of what we've seen with this patch. Um, and one thing I did want to kind of tag on there at the end, too, is um, our buddy, another buddy of the show, Bloodshed, right before the season started, he put it together a compilation of speed builds. So Riker kind of handled the high side of things with the greater rifts, and then Bloodshed kind of utilized the same ranking system. And then he did the speed builds that you might look to run in terms of like your fast GR clears or even fast T13 clears. And he also involved some of the community in asking them to test and see what their results were too. So if that's what you're kind of looking for, if that's your speed, then you can definitely check out that Mm -hmm. content from Bloodshed because he's got uh, all the speed builds that you could use. 
And I think, uh, I think that probably wraps us on Season 12, unless you want to make any bold predictions. What do you think we'll see the next time we reconvene for a show? What's, what's going to be the next thing that comes out of left field? Oh, I don't know. I mean, there have been a couple of... There have been a couple of things. Like I, like I previously, previously brought up, like, the whole Veers, Frozen Ore build. Like, it's Veers, but it doesn't actually use Veers. But it's Archon, but it's not Archon. It's Frozen Ore. Like, it, it, it's such a mind boggle. Mm -hmm. um, like, stuff like that. Uh, who would ever think M6? It's M6 N4. Like, or N6 M4. Like, why? Mm. Um, yeah, like, stuff like that. Where, like, genuinely new play styles. Those are going to be the weird and wacky things. And. Hopefully we haven't seen the last one. Hopefully there's a few more in the pipeline that people are working on that we just haven't been able to see them yet through the uh, thick of it. Uh, that is the internet, but hopefully they'll make their way through. We'll see it because it it also means that we're with the game. Even though we got this giant rebalancing patch, there's still a lot to push with each set and each class. And hopefully by the end of it, uh, we'll actually see more play styles that will live more than just one patch cycle. I think that would be the greatest. Word. I feel that. I think we're probably, to cheat a little bit, I think we'll probably see some things that influence season from non-season because that's where a lot of people have the resources and the time oh, yeah. to mess <laughs> around. Uh, you know, if you have 5,000 Paragon, you can do a lot of everything. If you have <laughs> a bajillion yes. Death's Breaths, you can craft a lot of everything. So I don't know that maybe the outside will make the inside different but the thing to look at too is that within a season you only have so much limited time so the the incentive to experiment is lessened because if you make a bad gamble if you say that you think blessed shield is actually gonna eventually surpass condemn with enough love and that gamble turns out to be wrong then you should have put all that time into condemn instead of blessed shield so just depending on how much you value your final rank um, you might see more or less innovation but I guess that would be my hot take if I had to put one on the table. I wouldn't be surprised if you see some Blessed Shield Crusaders in four man. It might not be like, you know, all throughout the leaderboards, but you'll probably see a group or two or three where it's replacing the Witch Doctor. Because I think there's untested potential there. I think with the Akani leniency stacks that you can get and the way that monks can group everything up and barbs can pull everything, I don't know, there's something there and people just haven't been doing it yet. Yeah, I mean, it's been a while since Crusaders have been in the format meta law as, like, what, season three? Two? Sounds right. Long time ago. Yeah. But yeah, they broke they broke the support Crusader. It's funny, every now and again, some people will be like, hey, what about support Crusader? And I'll be like, hey, don't do that. <laughs> there is no reason to. <laughs> like, you want to waste your meds? Go ahead. <laughs> But I think it's uh, it's maybe a, a sign of people still trying to, you know, branch out and experiment more. So I'm always all for that, too, though. Feel free to mess around and test to your heart's content. Mm -hmm. All right. So I think that wraps us there. We can move on to our next topic, which came out yesterday and really took the Diablo subreddit by storm. You saw several videos produced by content creators yours truly bloodshed and even Riker just released one today this has to do with the Goldman Sachs analyst that made this wild prediction that Diablo sequel will be arriving at some point in 2019 and 2020 and so to give you kind of the full gist of this story is that there was an article on CNBC I can link it in the twitch chat right now so people can follow along uh, an article on CNBC where Activision shares are speculated to get a boost uh, from both an Overwatch sequel, quote unquote, and a Diablo sequel. And so some of the speculation here is that um, this analyst has made bold predictions in the past. He was predicting <laughs> Diablo whatever four or the next Diablo to release in 2018. And, uh, that was last year's prediction, and now this year's prediction is that it's actually coming in 2019 or even 2020. So, you know, take it all with a grain of salt. This is just someone's essentially informed financial analyst analysis trying to also now make 
analysis on that based on this game analysis or this development pipeline analysis. So I think that's a good of enough intro. What was your first take when you saw this? Did you think like bullshit? Maybe there's some credence here. Um, I think when it comes to anything with Diablo 4 or Diablo Next as nine bull coined, and I so love I, it because I agree with you don't have to the, uh, like put like all these like little like, uh, oh, expansion uh, or deals like, like is in the next. Bag. Um, and, uh, I think there's always an element of bullshit <laughs> because we've been through so many. Uh, Riker, we love you, but. The D4 is a misprint, it's a sign! Like, <laughs> oh, no. Um, I think there's always an element of that, and then I read it, I read through it quickly. Um, went there, I'm like, oh, okay, and then I remember, like, what I said, what I've said a couple of times, uh, in your stream chat, whenever the topics come up. It's like, you, you, you know, if it's, if it's nothing more than an educated guess based on what he knows, if it's more or less what we know, or even less. I mean, I've always said two years ago, and I was actually thinking about it, and I can add a little bit more to it. Two years ago, it seemed like uh, that a couple. That's when it seemed like a couple of the bigger people were leaving the team, and I was figuring, you know, even though that was like a bad sign for us per se, because oh my god, people are leaving the team. When you also kind of think about it, if they were going to be starting a new project. They were gonna. That, that's a long-term commitment, because they're gonna need people there for a couple of years to be there for the conceptual design, getting the right people in, helping those people get there, and then if you're in the the storytelling, okay, you have to come up with the story. If you're in the graphics, you have to help come up with the initial graphics. If you're in the conceptual design, you have to help with the conceptual design to help the artists, and then if you're an artist, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if they they were starting the concept of Diablo 4 two years ago, then those people may have left because they didn't want to have a commitment to that because maybe it just wasn't their jam anymore. Or maybe they want, or more, more importantly, they wanted to, to pursue more creative outlets that they haven't uh, tapped themselves, which makes sense because a lot of those people, if you track them down, have moved on to other game development studios. I think uh, Brian Kreekin, if I say his last name right at all. The story guy? Uh, I think he moved over to um, Paragon, and I think he's helping with story there. A couple of people have moved over to uh, Barnfire, which if, you look, which if you go to Barnfire and you look at their staff page, it's like 75% plus ex-Blizzard employees. I'm looking forward to what they put out just for that fact alone. Um, so when you think about that two years ago, it actually makes a lot of sense because if people are leaving, that's because they made one or two more creative outlets. They didn't want to give that kind of commitment because they felt that they did it already. And they just wanted to move on, which is good because then they get new blood in there and then there's fresh ideas and you're not tied to the way things were done, which is also a, a good point. So then I'm, I'll just quickly go through everything else. So last year is when uh, we started getting a lot of job postings, not not the game director one, but a lot more like uh, supervisorial or higher level, but like still like, you know, conceptual guards and everything like that. And then this year is when it seems like the team felt like it, like we, we had no real indication, but it felt like it kind of, it's beginning to core less and with like the ever so lovely wording that Brandy gives us, like, you know, there, there may not be nothing now, but stick with us, there's things in the future. Mm -hmm. And then you combine that with, okay, if two years ago is when they started conceptualizing and started looking for the core team, last year is when they got the head people of each department. This year is when the core team has probably been assembled and they can start moving forward next year is when they can start um going through and uh maybe getting like the actual game concept done rather than being on on a whiteboard actually have something there maybe have something by next year's blizzcon to announce and then the year after is when they have the alpha slash beta and by the end of 2020 is when we get the game so 
what was in the article, uh, along with what Riker said in his video, because he went a little bit more in depth into the actual person himself, along with what I said and what I feel. It all makes sense. I mean, it could be, it cannot be always, we in the devil of uh, community always have to take these things with salt, but it's logical. I mean, even last year, it was like, oh, something could happen. Like, it's ripe for an expansion. It's <laughs> two, three years after Reaper Souls. Yeah, sure, why not? So, I have no reason to not believe it. I have no reason to believe it. I, I, I think I've just put myself in the state of when it happens, it happens. Yeah, that seems to be the safest place to stand because it's kind of like if you move too far this way, hot lava on your feet. If you move too far that way, sinking ice particles underneath your feet. So, like, you, you don't quite know where to stand. I think in the middle is probably a good spot, though. I, I pretty much fell in line with what you said, too sort of given the past of what we know in terms of seeing those job postings go up and how long we've been seeing them especially if you do go back to that very first one for game director it's almost like one and a half years or so at this point and if that was when things were starting you talk about this changeover the changing of the guard with a lot of those key figures leaving the team and such mm -hmm. it seems kind of ripe for re regime change like a new thing that we should work on now a bigger idea a bigger project if at any point you were saying yeah, my work here is done. It's probably when the next thing is about to start up. You know, you're like, eh, I don't want to get my hands too dirty in this because then I might just get sucked into another three, four years of being on the, you know, the same thing when I want new blood elsewhere. Uh, so I, I feel that. I think that's a strong point to kind of keep in mind. But again, the timetable does seem to make sense. It's a safe, it's a safe bet, I think. Uh, you know, if it doesn't happen then okay, it's like a really long development or our speculation was off because they just hadn't started working on the game yet. If the bet is right on, then, you know, no one's surprised because it seems about the right amount of time. You know, I would guess a AAA game probably takes about four or five years to put together at this, you know, in the modern age and without yeah. any sort of uh, stuff going crazy like D3's development hell. I think that makes a lot of sense to yeah. say if, you know, they started recruiting and efforts for the next Diablo thing about one and a half to two years ago, then you can get start to guesstimate that two to three years from this moment uh, is when the next thing could arrive. And that puts you right squarely in 2019 through 2020 range. So I, I feel though, maybe your 2020 release, like the end of 2020, is probably, maybe this is me starting to get a little hyped up, but the, the <laughs> worst case scenario because that seems like really far out i could 100 percent happen too though but my i guess my hopeful timetable is that we do see 2018 as the year of leading up to this announcement at blizzcon and in 2019 oh, so. is the year of the technical alpha the beta etc with a release at the end of that year and maybe maybe if it does go to 2020 in the early part of that year um and i think there might be something to look at too i know see my when i look at sales and stuff my background is more from the music side of things and i know like december q4 is both good and bad for people to release stuff because a lot of holiday <clears throat> a lot of holiday albums come out it's christmas so people are spending money but at the same time it's kind of like at the end so it's not necessarily a good spot because your books are closing you've already kind of like done what you did for the year whereas like you know in q1 q2 you can get that nice boost to your uh revenue for that year and then get the investors really hyped up to keep giving you more money um so i mean someone with more business acumen would have a better sense of what that would be in terms of the ideal time to release a game and i think though maybe another part of what we should tackle in this guy's uh prediction or analysis is that he was speculating a slate of things, right? Like a mobile game as well, coming from mm -hmm. Blizzard. You know, this yeah. Overwatch thing that we kind of glanced over, which I think we all probably believe. I saw you saying it in um, the Slack chat. It's probably gonna be more akin to like a Heroes 2.0, right? Like a relaunching or like a big change of the guard, but still the base of Overwatch itself, not a brand new thing in the Overwatch world, right? Yeah, because that's what I was thinking because it, because when you think of Overwatch in its state now, with the sheer amount of manpower, manpower, money, oh my god, money, cannot be understated how much money Blizzard is throwing at this, uh, just Overwatch League, let alone the game itself, You're right. uh, it would not make sense in two years 
like what would it be two overwatch league cycles is the do the overwatch cycles go by the year i think it, yeah because the next one starts in january or the first one yeah because i'm not privy to how that all goes it would have made sense to go through your nor full inaugural season second one and then have the game uh, oh overwatch tip i think it will be overwatch 2.0 if anything because the game is great and we don't have Jeff Kaplan vision eyeglasses, <laughs> so we can't see what he sees. But I don't know how how much more you could add to that game to to functionally change it to a to to an Overwatch two. Like you can add another mode into Overwatch. You can add more maps into Overwatch. You can add more characters. You can come up. You can even come up with a fifth uh, class. I don't know what it would be. It would be some kind of weird, screwy hybrid. But even at that point, all this stuff could be easily manipulated and thrown into Overwatch. Yeah. There's no point to make a two because it's a bad investment because you have to wager uh, community turnover. How much of it is just going to leave uh, because you know the new hotness versus sticking with the old and all that. All this wondrous bs that you have to sift through so i think if anything it would be a 2.0 but even at that point what would overwatch 2.0 be like what would they do i mean the only thing the only glaring omission from overwatch is a is a single player campaign yeah but with it would even the addition of that even if they went to the full full nines and had something special for every character that point and every character after had its own single player uniqueness to it to expand the lore because they're really pushing that would that even quantify a two point i don't think so it would have to be bigger you'd you have to have more really i see here's what i'll disagree with you because i think adding that so when you just think about like what constitutes enough of a change to mark a 2.0 when I look at the heroes example, they like redid the currency, got those loot box type things in there. You know, to say good or bad on that. Um, major gameplay changes, and they're still rolling those things out too, like matchmaking changes, mode changes. And I could see something like like imagine if they do a single player campaign. They like add in sort of an arcade thing where now you can do the winter thing all the time or you do all these like funky modes that they've been trying out that have been seasonal and stuff all the time or just give the controls over to the players more like almost turn it into like that starcraft arcade thing um you know if there's if there's enough of a sea change where this isn't what you could do with overwatch before and more players flock to the game or at least the players that are there are playing longer and in a more diversified way maybe you call it that i mean at the end of the day it's Blizzard's choice whether they label it as such or not, and players are going to react to think, you know, that makes sense or it doesn't make sense. Um, I guess it really just depends on how much changes, and, and I guess where you as a person fall on the spectrum of how much needs to change in order for that title to make sense. Yeah, I mean, the, the reason, I mean, my biggest reason for saying that wouldn't be enough is when you think about Overwatch is a multiplayer game. So adding a single player component, even as wondrous as it would be, even as expansive as it would be, because there would be people who get it just to play the shit out of every character and every character after. And that would be a huge commitment on Blizzard's aspect. Do you imagine having to do 30, 40, 50 heroes worth of unique single player content? Uh, at that point, that would be a huge time investment. But I think Overwatch is the only game that could probably get away with that. But it's still the single player aspect. As soon as you play it, I don't want to say, I don't want to use the term it's dead content, but it's dead content. The only thing you have left to do is the multiplayer. Yeah, you can use that analogy elsewhere. All the Blizzard games, it's not perfect. But I think Dude, you have to. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm not letting you get away with this. Star this is the StarCraft model. Like, StarCraft expansions essentially exist to further the story and give you more single player campaign. And, and then Starcraft they add has in. It's always been that way. That's the difference. But we don't. But Overwatch is brand new. It has no model to follow. It could go any which way and call that its expansions or whatever. Uh, okay, I'll give you this. I'll give you an example of what would actually get me back to play Overwatch for a little bit. For a little bit. And it actually comes from Unreal Tournament. 
there was a mode in Unreal Tournament called, uh, I think it was Onslaught. And it's kind of, in a way, it's kind of like Capture the Point, except it's more expansive. And the way it works is there's two bases on the other side, kind of similar to what's here. And then you have to capture linked nodes from either side of your base. And then once you capture nodes, you can go capture the next one. But at some point, think of like a straight line that has dots on it. You have to capture all the dots, all the bases, until you capture the base uh, right before the enemy's base, and then you're allowed to attack the enemy base's core, and then you basically try to destroy it, get it to 100, and then you win. But it's a tug of war. It's always it's cyclical. Mm -hmm. It's not like how Overwatch is now, where okay, you get point A, okay, you got it, you hold it forever. No, this is a, a tug of war. You can go back and forth. Yeah, it can go longer, granted. But I think Overwatch could easily get that moded because. They already have the point captures. They have big enough maps for it. And then they could actually expand the concept with, you know, maybe in-place defenses or expanding uh, certain characters' abilities with unique map power-ups. Like, you know, the double damage that was in Unreal Tournament or the shielding mechanic. So they can make those maps feel bigger and more expansive. That's a mode that if it came in with a PvE, I would quantify that as a 2.0, along with all the new skins and all the new sprays and everything, because that would be massive to have that kind of scale, especially if it went from a 6v6 to a 10v10 in that mode, because it can handle it. That would be great, because then you would have something huge, and you would also have more maps to look forward to. So it's something you get now, and it's something you get more maps in the future, along with having this massive single player edition, that would be a 2.0 in my mind. I feel like reworking okay. everything. Okay. I feel like basically you're only you're looking at it from a far more personal point of view than a general consumer point of view because it sounds like to me that you just don't care for PvE that much. You want a different sort of way to compete against other people. And so if that's thrown into the bucket, then suddenly it's enough. But you just stated in the thing that, and this also, by the way, we're like an Overwatch podcast right now. But we'll get off this topic in a second. But you just stated John, that we're sorry. it'd be an easy enough thing for them to implement versus all the hard work that would go into a PVE. So it sounds crazy to me to say that PVE alone wouldn't constitute enough to mark a 2.0 with how much work would go into it and how much you would be able to get out of it. I, I don't know. I just feel like... It, it depends on how objective you want to be about it. Because if something appeals to you and pops into the game, then of course you're like, wow, the value on this. This is such a 2.0. This is a huge change. But if I'm coming in and all I want is single player and I don't care about any of the other competitive modes, then they could add as many of those as they want. And to me, the PV would be enough to mark a huge change to say it's 2.0. Yeah, I mean, it's not that I don't disagree. I mean, yes, it, it's a huge time investment, but... I'm also trying to look at it high, like 30,000 feet in the air kind of view. Like, yes, it's a massive time investment. It would be a great thing. It would, people would enjoy it. It would basically be like every time you play, it's like you play your own little personal uh, hero cinematic that they do. It, it would be great and amazing, and I'm not doubting it. It's just it's not the aim of the game. And, that, and that's why I feel that they would have they would do that in combination with something else. And then that would be, instead of being, you know, grand, it would be almost unbearably, like, massive. Like, oh my god. And, and they would throw it in, it would be like, you know, this $10 thing you buy and you get everything. Or how, or it would be free, and then they would have, like, a thousand things you could spend, like, way too much money on loot boxes for, because you want that Witch Mercy skin, again, for Halloween. But, okay. All right. This is a double podcast. Yeah, I we're just we're literally like parsing small things here. I think the the big takeaway from this is that there are things down the pipeline for Blizzard as a whole, and I guess the reason I brought that back into the conversation was just to say that maybe the release date of whatever the next Diablo game is doesn't even matter because it would just fit into the production slot of. You know, here's our mobile game, we're going to plunk that in early 2018. Here's the Overwatch thing that's like mid-2018. 
or 2019, sorry. And here's the Diablo thing that's late 2019, and then we have wiggle room to push any of those around or something to that effect. Um, I think one thing that can kind of tie in our next topic to this speculation topic is also what's happening with the current game. I was talking to Nineball just before we were kind of preparing for the podcast tonight, and he was mentioning that, you know, it's kind of do or die time for the PTR. Because normally we see a PTR yeah. rollout, you know, a month or so into the latest season that's active. Uh, and that would be like this week. This should have been yesterday if it's going to stick to a Tuesday schedule or some point during this week if it's a little off day. Um, or next week. And that was that's really it if you look at the windows. Because we all know that Blizzard kind of takes a nice holiday break. And Christmas, like we said at the outset of the show, is coming up in about a week and a half now. So you have next week to throw a PTR into the wind, or I don't think it's going to happen at all. Like, we know the January event is coming. That's not going to need a patch or anything. That's just something they turn on. And uh, if there's no PTR, then what does that mean? You know, are they then working so heavily on whatever's next that there's just no more patches? Or are we going to see a longer downtime between patches? Or, like, where does your sense fall within trying to read into whether we have a PTR or not? I mean, what you said is right. I mean, if it doesn't happen tomorrow, I don't even think it's going to happen. Well, it could. I don't want to say, I want to use absolutism. If it doesn't happen tomorrow or Friday, it could happen next week. But if it happens next week, it's going to happen like that Tuesday because they're going to use Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday to make sure that it's stable Mm. because then they're going to be gone probably Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. And since Christmas, you know, cradles is on that Monday, it it more or less cradles the weekend. And then as you also, as you said, I mean, Blizzard's most of the people are probably going to be out with vacation and everything until probably the second week of January until everyone's back in. And I think last year the PTR was delayed a week just for that reason. Hmm. Uh, or there, there was something delayed for that reason because oh, I think it was because uh, something was on a, it was a holiday on Monday, so uh, Wednesday became the new Tuesday. I think that's what it was. Um, but yeah, like if it doesn't happen tomorrow, I mean it's kind of sketchy if it happens next week just for stability and monitoring reason, and then. That's a good point. Good riddance for the next two to three weeks after that. I mean, I mean, this just may be they got it down um, to the point where this kind of harkens back. I think it was season seven and eight where there was no patch, and you know it was what it was. And I tell you the truth, I would would ex- kind of be shocked if there was a PTR where they did more than just a few set weeks hmm. at all. Because they just did a, a huge time investment to get the sets going um, to where they are now. Why would they? Why would they spend more time now unless they just really ran out of development time last PTR cycle? They couldn't capture something, which I can see being the only real excuse they have to try to capture something in a small PTR esque uh, patch. Uh, but if we don't have a PTR, we still have the event. Uh, the season's still going to go by. Everyone's enjoying it. I just think it'll just be one of those weird morale things like, oh, there's no PTR. All right. It's like it's something we've always had something to look forward to, regardless of how big or how small it was. It was always something there. And I think that's the real mental block people have. Like, oh, there's no PTR. Did game. Like, well, <laughs> like they, just, they, they just fixed it. Like, like give them credit. Yeah, but I do think there is a little bit more to read into this one in particular. And so there's two ways to go with it, I think, because there's the idea that this 2.6.1 was so big that they can lay off of having a big change of a patch for, you know, season 13. uh, Because you can just continue forward, like people are still figuring things out. Maybe there's more builds that haven't yet been pushed, etc. So the next season could still have enough stuff left over from 2.6.1's changes to sustain itself and then they're giving themselves more time to have a bigger ptr or or 
you're then trying to look at again tied back to this analysis from goldman sachs etc that you know they have now fully shunted their efforts away from d3 it's going to sit in maintenance mode as people love to say and then you know they're gonna do bug fixes and such like we just recently saw a hot fix i think it was monday to address a couple of bugs and you might see stuff like that go forward where the patches if they do happen are small just to tweak a little thing here or there you know change over the hadrix gift and the conquest for the next season and that could honestly be it and i think maybe to get that analysis more traction we'd have to see another season and whether there's a ptr or not because i think just missing one is kind of not enough evidence right like you can't <laughs> you need you need to set a tread line exactly you can't establish a pattern from one thing you're like oh it didn't happen d4 guys here we go so i i do feel like um you're probably on the better track in terms of like you know we can lay off a little bit maybe just look toward what happens in uh, january with the event and then 2.6.1 and its lifespan still kicking along and then in season 13 we can really start to think about the repercussions and the meanings and such behind whether there's ptr or not but it is something to keep in mind like i i agree with you from the stability point of view it definitely needs to come sooner than later if it's going to come at all yeah and i and i do like what you said about the whole um how even though this may be so much of a season seven eight where there was no ptr and everything was fine that it it, it sets up what we've only had back then where the first season is the tinkering season and the next season is the uh min max refinement season so mm -hmm. that actually so basically the net the the next season in that progression even though maybe the same deal it's the everyone who's taking notice that's that when to be like okay it took us th this is how much we got this is how much we got done this is what we did what can we do better? How, how much faster can we go? What can what should we do? What should we just not do again? And you build basically building your battle plan from second one to to the sixtieth day. And I, and I think if we don't see a GR one fifty this season, which I think is still off, next season is where people will get closer, um, and then go from there as far as the augments because they'll know what to focus on what not to get those augments as high as possible get that gear as refined as possible and then just keep on pushing and fishing and fishing and fishing i think that's where for those high level players that's a season that's actually awesome because all the variables are basically gone because yeah. they've already gone through them all so they know what to expect i think that's and from my perspective not being particularly one of those players, it still is interesting because when I do all the graph work at the end of the season, it's nice to see still those upticks on certain classes, even though I do the solo. When we, I think we're all wondering when that 150 clear is going to come in, whether it's this season, next, uh, or how close people are going to be able to get. Definitely. Yeah, I, I think that is a strong point. And those are probably the people who would last the longest in a season anyway, so they'd be the ones to care about you know i guess to, I, maybe the other way around they'd be the ones who wouldn't care as much whether things change or not in fact they'd almost be not wanting it to change just for that refinement purpose but i think there also is kind of the idea that people like when things get refreshed a little bit we just had a lot of that refreshment right so i think that is it can be it can be seen as both a pro and a con if it continues because then it's starting to get staler but as it gets staler you have it more figured out so you can take better advantage of it it depends on which uh, player base you're catering towards too, though, because I could see a lot of people, uh, and we didn't really talk about this, I wanted to wrap it into the Season 12 analysis a little bit, but we're already seeing a decent chunk of people kind of uh, taking their time now with a mid-season lull, if you will, where, you know, five weeks in, it kind of is about that time where it starts to happen. And also yeah. the timing in the real world with holidays, with exams, with school and such, you know, people are, their attention is being pulled in a lot of different ways. So I'll actually be curious to see if there's an uptick actually in maybe about two weeks or so when kids are on vacation and colleges are kind of done for a little bit. Maybe more players will come back. Um, but I don't know. It's uh, I think you might see a casual player having less incentive to play when there's not a big change, when there's not, ooh, when there's not something to be super duper excited about. 
uh, as far as like, multi shots amazing, you have to come and try it. <laughs> Next season is like, well, it's just as good as it always was, but maybe you already tried it. So I don't know what the selling point is exactly, besides like, here's your new Hatrix gift, you can start with it right away. Um, mm -hmm. So that's something to consider. I think this though, unless you have any more points on PTR or Goldman Sachs, but I think this is a good segue jumping off point for another topic that's tough to cover because uh, I think it's easy to get very frustrated about it. And uh, yeah. Nine and Wolfcrier last se last episode covered it a bit, but we're talking about botting. We're t dancing around the word, but we're talking about botting, cheating in Diablo 3 and kind of the fact that it's at its highest heights, it seems right now. There was uh, something that sparked a little bit more attention to this just a couple of days ago when Menegis posted on Reddit his research looking into the top players. And this is kind of how you determine who's botting and who's not botting. It's not 100% conclusive, but you can certainly draw some conclusions based on what you see. So the mode of research is taking, you know, at the time that you're looking at players, exactly how many hours have transpired for for the current season, right? So say for ease of numbers, there's 500 hours in the season at the time that I'm now going to look at someone's uptime on the season. And if you look and someone has played 450 hours out of 500 hours, that amount of uptime is just insane, right? Like that's almost near 100% of you playing Diablo 3. Anyone that reaches near 100% uptime is clearly botting because they haven't slept, they're not taking food breaks, and you know the way to look at this, a lot of people get confused because they're like, oh, maybe they just rebirthed the character so the hours are off. You can look at just seasonal numbers if you look at someone's seasonal tab and see what their playtime is on the different classes. So you can easily separate that information out so there's not you know this rebirth thing skewing the data. I want to get that out of the way. And also some people are like, well, if you idle in town and you can just idle all night, leave your computer on, then you'll be fine. But the game does disconnect you if it doesn't detect like keyboard movement, mouse movement. So those are also things that kind of, you know, if you're trying to give as much <laughs> a benefit of the doubt, there are some things that remove some benefit. Uh, so you can pretty much start to conclude that there are some people out there doing things that they really shouldn't be doing and ruining the competitive integrity of Diablo 3. Now, Dredd, I know you have had some thoughts on this. You've written some articles and such, so I'd like you to maybe take the floor. How do you feel about the botting? How would you solve some botting? Do you feel like Blizzard should be doing more, less? How do you feel I right mean, now? I mean, my thoughts are more philosophical than anything else because, I mean, that's what it really is. Because, okay, because you have to kind of start, like, all good things. You have to put yourself in the perspective of someone who is actually botting. You have to ask yourself, why putting yourself in their shoes? Why am I botting? The most, I guess, I don't want to say goodwill, but I guess the most naive answer and the most, I guess, quote unquote acceptable is when people say, oh, I don't have enough time, but I want to push the leaderboard. <laughs> so they want to be a, a leaderboard pusher, which is a huge time investment. Everyone that's quote unquote legitimate is putting a massive amount of time into mm -hmm. it meanwhile they want to shortcut the hard work aspect of it so while it's good natured in attention it's kind of like the phrase the way the hell is paid with good intentions uh, so there's that and then you go to the most extreme which is the person just legitimately just does not give a crap I mean let's just put it out there I mean, people linking, certain people on Twitter linking certain primal images where we see Turbo HUD icons. <laughs> <laughs> in the screenshot, it's like, oh, you just don't care because you don't even bother looking for that in your screenshot. So, you, when you start putting into the mentality of that, and then you go, okay, why are those kids? So, you, why are they botting? And then you have that. And then you go, well, what are they gaining from botting? Like, okay, they're organic Paragon levels. And then this is kind of harking on what uh, Levo is doing to me. I mean, for the longest time, actually, and this is the article I wrote, is the best way to fix Paragon is to get rid of it. Don't put caps on it. Don't do, like, one main stat after 800 because that just trivializes Paragon. I mean, it kind of goes back to other uh things like that don't put diminishing returns on it because then you just make it mathy and complicated for no reason is you just get rid of paragon 
you take all the stats that you would gain, like your critical hit damage, your critical hit, and all that other stuff, and you put it back on the gear, and you spread it evenly between where those stats normally fall. And in the article, I came up with a way to figure that out formulaically wise. And when you think about it that way, in some regards, it may open up certain gear slots to certain other affixes, because if you're getting more quote unquote, like CDR in two slots, and that can actually cover what you normally get in three gear slots, then that third gear slot becomes open. So automization may open up in that aspect. So the only thing you're losing is main stat. And the way you handle main stat is you put the main stack in the work of augments. You just either A, double the amount of main stat you get through augments, or you leave it the same and you allow people to double augment their gear. So you still need people to put in the hard work to level up their gems, but you put it into work as far as augmenting gems. Because I, I, it was always a strange thing in my eye that they didn't fix the Paragon issue, but they came up with augments. So it's like augments were a poor man's uh, shortcut to what the high level people had with their high level Paragons. But the high level people were going to get those augments anyway, so they got accelerated even more. Mm -hmm. So the gap between the lowest level players and the highest level players only expanded. And we hear where we are. So. If you get rid of Paragon, what's the next thing on the bucket list? Bounty mats. So then you have to figure out, okay, do we lower bounty mats to the point where you only need maybe one of each for a reforge? And then what's the next thing? Regular mats. And then rift keys. So uh, in a weird way, I think botting will always be there in a sense. Yes. But if you approach it from a development standpoint and just minimize why it's botting to the point of you're really just dumb for doing it because you can just play and get everything then you might as well just do it but at the same time i mean this topic can go just anywhere and it is and this is why it's so hard like do you do weekly band waves like that's nice and all but blizzard really can't announce it because the way the, the way botting works and the way it always has been in traditional hacking and making programs and detecting them is the people making the hacks are always and forever will be one step ahead of the people trying to find them. Because if the tech, because they're the ones coming up with the technology, and Blizzard's the one who has to try to come up with tech to detect it. You can't have, like, it's like the chicken and egg philosophy. That's, that's exactly what it is. So, it, it, it's a tough topic. It would be nice if, you know, they put in the seasonal previews and the first looks there was a thing at the bottom about botting and turbo hut <laughs> saying like this is ex explicitly illegal and i guess our terms of service agreement so it was defined in an official blog yeah it's not going in with a band wave it's not doing that but it's stating like these are bannable offenses we are going to scare you shitless now to not use these so at least that's a step in the right direction and then if they did a band wave mid-season and one at the end of the season and pull those people from the leaderboard, that would be another step in the right direction. It's never going to be perfect. That's the thing we all as players have to realize. But there are many steps that could get us there. They just have to be taken. Yeah, I think you covered a lot of things that I wanted to bring up. Um... Because again, like reforging the systems, rethinking the way that the game's developed. Right now, the game is a botter's paradise because there are a lot of systems that work in synergy with each other to mm -hmm. make botting a very lucrative thing to do. And it gives you everything you need to be the best on you know your server. With, between getting Paragon, which is just going to increasingly uh, give your character uh, more power... Also, bounty mats, which essentially allows you to have infinite chances at perfect gear. Uh, and even like keys, which then gives you less time that you have to spend farming keys, which is technically a very oh, inefficient yeah. thing to do since you're not doing greater rifts, which is where all the experience is. And I Sorry. heard. 
Sorry. Popping <laughs> my wrist on the camera. I heard even <laughs> now, though, that there are bots that also just legitimately run greater rifts overnight, too. So even if, like, let's say you run your bot, you get a bajillion keys, you're not maybe using all those keys in your rat runs, then also that night you can say, well, I have keys. I'm going to run my bot to now run some greater rift solos on my Crusader, which I, I guess the botting is being mainly done for this particular event with Crusaders because Condemn can roll through pretty high level greater rifts very quickly on solo and they're just getting even more ancillary experience there too so they're just always improving the status of their account while you're sleeping or dealing with your kids or going to work doing things that keep you away from the game so their advantage is huge mm -hmm. doing things that minimize the advantage like even uh drop in chat saying you know change the system in paragon even if you don't super overhaul it or throw it all out to just giving you plus one main stat after a certain amount of paragon gained even that would help because it's then lowering the advantage you get right like if i'm a legit player and my expected paragon by the end of the season is 2000 right and a botter is getting you know upwards of close to 4000 well that plus five main stat balloons their advantage oh yeah to two to ten thousand main stat right so if it scaled back to plus one after one thousand or plus one after two thousand now they're only gaining two thousand but you have literally taken away 80% of their advantage. So they'll still have it. Like there's still incentive to bot. Like you said, there always will be. But you're just making the advantage of it or perhaps the allure of it a little less great. Especially if we're assuming that at some point they might actually get caught and have their account actioned. Uh, so I think, I think there's probably a lot of different things that could be done. One thing I always see people state is wishing for a greater frequency of bans. I think across multiple seasons and seeing no bans, hell yeah, there should definitely be an increased frequency. It should at least mm -hmm. be one per season. But you said it best in that botters and bot makers in particular love information and that's how they stay one step ahead. So if you ban weekly, you're just giving the bot makers so much more information on how your detection works, what you're looking for, what they know you can detect. And so they're just going to continually be able to iterate their bots to escape more and more detection and then eventually you, you lose the race as uh, anti-cheats by not being able to um, keep up. And I think one thing to also consider too, and it's something that people don't want to hear, but Diablo 3 is a competitive game, but it's not esports. And I think a lot of the anti-cheat efforts, when you also know how Blizzard works and you know that the anti-cheats team supports every game, there's a lot more incentive for the anti-cheats to funnel their energy and their dollars and their um, time on the esports side of their offerings because if there's a big bug or a big cheat that's going to persist throughout their Overwatch, then guess what? That hurts your Overwatch League. If there's a big bug or a big cheat that's getting into Hearthstone for some reason, then now your Hearthstone World Championship could actually be affected by that. And there's real dollars on the line with these players' livelihoods at stake, mm -hmm. investors, sponsors, etc. So I think, you know, as much as people say it, Diablo really is kind of low on the totem pole when it comes to uh, resources given towards it. And it's not to say that it should be any less important. Like, they have that orc statue with those, you know, placards around it stating their core values, and one of them is play fair. And I think we should be playing fair across every IP that Blizzard has, including Diablo 3. But right now, there's really no incentive for people to play fair because they just feel like they can do whatever they want unchecked. And like you said, to the point where people have the audacity, they have the gall to just like post screenshots or even YouTube videos. Like I had a war in the Crusader subreddit uh, a couple of weeks ago <laughs> where some guys just like, hey, by the way, check out my 112 clear mate, it's sick. And everyone's commenting like, hey, how can you have all those information things on your skills and stuff? It's like, oh, it's just Turbo, you know, it's like a cool resource you can use. Like, no, you can't. What? We're just actually talking about this in the open now? You can hide it. Like, just lie to casual me. casual hub use. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm on the hub. Like, what? <laughs> you can you can hide it. You can make a video where you actually, you're still using it in your clear, but I can't see it when you show me your video. But people are just like, they don't even care anymore. Like, oh yeah, no, you, like, check it out, bro. I got Turbo HUD going. It shows me that pylon right over there. Sick. Like, it's, it's pretty ridiculous, man. So. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things. And this is the thing that we as a community, because I, I, I told myself to go by this tenet 
than this uh, principle. Every time I try to think about an issue in the game, any anything that's a problem in this game, no matter how much it seems one-sided, no matter how PO'd and pissed off you get, is always 50% the developers and 50% the community. Because while it may be only up to developers to come up with a solution, implement it, so we have a solution to a problem we see, we have to be the ones to articulate the problem, be graceful in our presenting of the problem, and be forceful in wanting the problem to be done, but not be complete assholes about it. <laughs> and also understanding that when it comes to this particular problem, it is not the Diablo 3 development team that is responsible. There is an entire different segment that handles this. So all, so if you go on the D3 forums, you say, oh, you guys suck, you guys aren't helping us. Well, that does nothing. It does nothing but waste your time, waste their time, bring down morale across the community because they are not the ones who are primarily responsible with fixing this problem. There's an entire division that handles all this, like you said, uh, Levi. Yeah. And so the best thing you can do as an individual in this community is if you see something suspicious, send in a feedback report. If you see something going, if you see a lot of things happening, make a proper feedback form post. You have to do it because if every because if everybody or the vast majority of the people in the community did it, that it would be a tsunami wave of respectful yet forceful change this, and then they would have to respond. But when you have this mixture of people not knowing, and you know you have to give people the benefit of the doubt that most people don't know that you know the anti cheat is an actual separate department. And all that other stuff is handled not by uh, the Diablo 3 team. But it's the same thing with WoW. It's just, but also, like you said, how big is Diablo compared to WoW? Compared to Overwatch, compared to Heroes, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. It, it has to be... It has to be properly directed and it has to be properly carried. Otherwise, it's like the old, it's like the old phrase, shit in, shit out. <laughs> <laughs> and that's as best as you can... Uh, expect so yeah that, that's about it <laughs> i think i think one thing to maybe uh at least rope in here as we start to conclude on this though is Dropadusky made a point in chat that one thing to keep in mind even like i think the community itself understands that maybe diablo's not the biggest priority at the moment and hopefully it will be with the next thing uh but there is certainly cachet especially going forward if you're even going to have a next thing and you want this community to support that next thing to keep the community morale up right so i think you're seeing people frustratedly expressing their derision for blizzard not being active enough against bots and against cheating and anti-cheat measures um, and i think you definitely make a great point in that we should probably word those uh conversations better in terms of like n less verbal attacks and more just like Here's my reasoning on why I want you to do something about this. Uh, you know, there are no anti-cheat forums to go and post in, so they kind of have to post where they post. But I hope that it is done in a, in a manner that's productive and not necessarily super negative, because that, like you said, only stands to get everybody down. Um, but it's it's I think there's a huge thing here where the community itself is starting to crumble a little bit. Uh, when we're not concerned about, you know, where's the news at for the next big thing, then all we have is the game that we currently have. And if the game that we currently have is being overtaken by cheating and unchecked, you know, disregard for what's supposed to be right, then what's the point to even stick around? Now I don't know what the future is. Now the present is really crappy. Maybe I'll just go play something else. And so I think there yeah, is... Th there there's, a, th there's almost like... A, sorry to interrupt, but there's almost yeah. like a amplification uh, mm. that kind of... Like, as you said, when there's not a lot to focus on, anything that would be small before is just magnified, magnified. And amplified. Yeah. And you just focus more on it and it just becomes a bigger part of your day and your mentality. And... I feel that it's very unfortunate that it, that this is happening now where I feel the Diablo 3 community is actually re finally rebouncing back with all the great streamers that are there. I mean, I think there's like a good dozen and a half, two dozen that are just constant and 
a partner that they do their thing and there's no real animosity going on. There's no like people looking down on each other. There's still great content creation. In fact, the football podcasts are coming back to life. It's not just you guys and you guys. Um, <laughs> but it would be a shame if all that's bouncing back and the game itself gets a little rocky or more than rocky at this point. So I, I think we need to really just kind of go, could it, could we just do a few more things? That would be a few small things, but it would make a tremendous difference. Yeah, well said. I think that's probably a great spot to leave this conversation at. You know, all we can do is all we can do is wait because it's not really up to us. We've voiced our opinions. We've let them know how we feel. Uh, some some of us with stronger words than others, but I guess yeah, that's it's a good point good point to leave that so hopefully this conversation isn't one that we have to continually keep having hopefully there will be something that rolls down in 2018 to dissuade people um from doing those things uh with that is there anything else news wise or anecdotal that you would like to bring up before we head into our community section of of the show hey Kind of, kind of a little static towards the end. Can you just repeat that again? Sorry. I was just asking if there's any last wrap-up things you want to toss in there before we hit the uh, community section. Uh, oh, not right now. All right. Taking it for the go. Good, good, Keep good. So with that being said, you guys know that one of our big parts of the show, of course, is reading all those lovely emails that you guys sent us. But we don't have any this week or this show. So... I know that it's getting towards the uh, end of the year here. What we would like to do is encourage you to send in your missives at westmarchworkshop at blizzpro.com or even over Twitter since you can tweet one million characters now, by the way. Uh, And let us know kind of how your 2017 went overall. Were you excited when the Necromancer finally released? How'd you feel about BlizzCon this year? Were there any sort of marquee moments from the different seasons that we had over the year? Uh, you know, give us sort of a history of how things fared for you, what you're excited for in the future, if you believe in any of this analysis or forecasting of what's next for Diablo and such. And uh, let's wrap up the year on on, a, on an interesting note. Let's hear from you guys. Keep those comments and emails and things coming in. And we'll also probably do some recapping as well on the show official, some top tens, maybe some highlight moments and things like that uh, to really, you know, do our end of year justice but that being said, we do have some items of the week. Wee, wee, wee. Hey, look at that. You did the echo. All right. So I'm going to hit up a couple of those. We have four entrants this week. And they are pretty darn cool items. And one of them, I'm so happy to announce, is the return of an old tradition. Where we used to always showcase, no matter what, every ancient furnace that we ever got because back in the day and this this tradition started so long ago at this point it's almost irrelevant because most classes either don't use a furnace anymore hello crusaders or uh you know they're just they're just there because they drop all the time now since they made that change with 2.6.1 for those rarer items to fall a little bit more frequently but in any case we have an ancient furnace in here, and I'm actually bad right now because I forgot who set this in. Hold on, let me make some adjustments. Uh, this is where Nine Ball crushes this. This is how you know who does what on the show, because now we're at a part where I'm like, ah, what do I do? Here we go. So this is from Baz Freeman, and he sent us in this lovely furnace. It's ancient, like I said, 3,917 deeps uh, with 1380 intelligence, 1298 vitality. Chance to deal 22% area damage on hit. Secondaries of monsters kill monster kills grant 223 experience. And I believe that's 46%. This is so small on my screen. 46% chance of or not chance. 46% increased damage against elites. Oh, and man. usually that's that 40 you know, to 50% look, range. It's like I look at that and it's not perfect. It's ancient. And like it's almost like it's almost like I want to say it's a like, like cute in a way like oh, that's like a cute that reminds me of like firebirds <laughs> and, and, and like 
you know, in like season one, we were like, oh my god, a GR38 was like amazing. 41, you were a god. Right, and, and you were this, dying like, for a furnace. Like that, that area damage, if you rolled 10%, you'd be like the embodiment of, of like wizard kind at that point. <laughs> uh, those days. I know it's it's weird how much has changed and that's kind of why I love like the end of the year and like the recaps because even over the course of a year so much can change too I mean this one in particular will be interesting like we keep saying with how much 2.6.1 brought in mm -hmm. next up is a dainty's binding and this is a primal sort of back to a uh, reality back to life here in terms of items that you should be looking out for some dainties binding love here. This is a primal one, like I mentioned. 650 intelligence, 650 vit. Rerolled for a 15% life roll. And a 516 armor. And then a secondary of some more monster kills, granting experience. And then, of course, the lovely power on this, where you gain an additional 50% damage reduction when there is an enemy afflicted by any of your curses. This one comes in from Functropus. You guys know from the ridiculous emails that are often mm -hmm. sent in. Uh, and he did put a little message with this, says, Avast! I'm so excited I don't even have anything weird to say. <laughs> Magic puppies have trotted down from the high heavens and sprinkled my proverbial fire hydrant with their RNG effluvium. That's a new word. I have the power! And that is what he wrote to attach this lovely dainties binding here. So congrats, it's beautifully rolled. Even got the armor roll on there as an intelligence class. Yeah, that, that's always the uh, nerve-wracking moment when you see those triple brackets in chat going, Oh, please, please just let it have the armor and the main stat. Please. <laughs> it's gotta be. And up next for our last two items of the week, we have a pair of Traveler's Pledges. And they actually look exactly the same. This one comes in from our, one of our uh, console players, as you can see on the screen there if you're looking at the video feed. Uh, from Seahawk15. Submitting a Traveler's Pledge, also submitted a Manticore that he received as well, but of course we usually just show one item. Uh, it's got, and I, th I think I said it's Primal, this is a Primal one by the way. And mm -hmm. it has 1000 Dexterity, 100% Critical Hit Damage, rerolled for a 10% Critical Hit Chance, and of course a Socket that it comes with, like all Primal Jewelry does. Uh, except for the Obzod. Sorry, Dread. <laughs> On the secondary, <laughs> on the secondaries, we have a seven percent damage from melee attacks reduction, and then an eighty percent gold from monsters. And if we fast forward to the other primal travelers pledge that we got, it's like it's deja vu all over again. This one comes in from uh, forty-two, and it's another dexterity travelers pledge. Uh, primal ancient one thousand dex critical hit damage increased by hundred percent. Rerolled for a critical hit chance increased by 10%, and also, of course, that socket. And this one actually has a Bane of the Trapped in it, rank 101, and a secondary of 210 physical resistance and reduced duration of control impairing effects by 40%. Mm, that is resist. Oh, yes. Always nice when you see a good resistance, or even like a like the other one had a reduction to melee or ranged or something. Yeah. Those are primo secondary stats. And that's going to wrap it for our uh, items of the week. And it also will wrap us for the entire show. So, mm -hmm. that's it, man. How do you feel? Feels pretty good. Feels good, man? Feels good. Excellent. Uh, how do you... Uh, I want to ask you this. How do you feel since Night is here taking up his box? <laughs> uh, the jokes that could be made we'll, we'll just let him figure that one out take it up his watches. box um, uh, how do you feel because there's uh, only one more show before the end of the year yeah it's been a year man I think I mean I guess I should save a decent amount of this for the next show the last show of the year but it's been a wild ride just from hanging out I guess we can actually do this part here though hanging out with you at PAX East this year and getting to kind of be a part of that cold yeah it was cold i mean it's cold right now it's 20 degrees out bro uh, uh, okay 30 degrees and no wind versus 19 degrees and like 30 30 mile hour wind gusts that's a whole breed that's a whole another side of cold i could live with that yeah i'm with you <laughs> but that was just a cool kind of you know something that makes the year a little different right because we probably won't ever have another year like that again where it was sick to have that event you drove all the way up for it 
Uh, we got to hang out with Brandy. Um, yeah. We had the drinks that made us warmer, so that was nice. We got into the Hearthstone event finally. <laughs> yeah, after standing around for one well, billion years, five minutes, and we got up and it's like, yeah, yeah they're gonna be done like half an hour. time to go. <laughs> But that was cool, and then to like bring all that info back, be part of the reveal of the female necromancer, be under embargo for the first time, which is kind of different and interesting. Um, yeah, and I remember, I don't know what I did. I think I claimed Hooky on that Monday or Tuesday <laughs> or whenever. No, it was Monday. I think we, it, 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 and like, like, thank God I did because we needed like three hours to get like the articles and the image and all that stuff edited and done to really get sent out. And we did we did an awesome job on that. I think we actually cared a lot more than most of the other places. Like, yeah, we're gonna do like this little two paragraph for it up. Like, yeah, like a female character. Ooh, there's all these new skills that we only saw six of them. Mm -hmm. Come on. Try a little bit more. <laughs> well, I mean, that is going to be your major difference between, like, hey, we cover everything. We're PC gamer versus, like, we love Diablo more than anything else. So I think we did it justice, though. Terriel would have been proud. And yes, replay. Uh, Levi, Nine, myself. And, uh, well, we saw it all at BlizzCon when they had the initial reveal. And then they had kind of like a pseudo secret. We are underneath an embargo until X until X stipulated day and date and time at which we could then release. Uh, it was the female necromancer and it was all the melee-ish uh, abilities at the time. Yeah. Uh, there was like a like whole like little mini PowerPoint presentation. We were allowed to play the demo once, only once. So you had to take your time because it was a regular riff. So it's like, yeah, I'm gonna make this riff last like 15 minutes. <laughs> really shit. Um, really try everything out, but it was a, it was a really good event. So yeah, it was it was awesome. Uh, so that's definitely a highlight. Um, of course, BlizzCon is always a highlight, and the fact that we keep making the trip bigger and longer and doing more things. I don't know how we're gonna top this year's next year, but I guess the Diablo year, announcement would certainly help. Well, that, and I think next year seriously has to be a streamer house. Like, it's streamer always a joke, house. but I think, like, the sheer amount of people we know, and, like, especially the amount of people that are willing to actually go, I think we could. It would just be like, oh, we're going to be, like, need a lot of money for Ubers. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. No, <laughs> there's... Because we won't be anywhere near the Amp Convention Center at that point. Yeah. Maybe a time to rent a car at that point. Yeah. Um... Yeah, bro. Yeah, I don't know. I'll turn the question on you, though. Like, had since you won't technically be on the show, maybe you'll do a write-in or something, but are there any other year-in-review sort of highlights that you had or things that you're proud or I happy mean, of that you produced? And keep talking, but I'm going to go get something, too, to show on stream. Yeah. I mean, it's been... It's actually been a really good year. I mean, just being on the show a little bit more, uh, committing myself to those... GR uh, sheets and finally doing the articles. So that's why everyone could. That's why everyone could see a little bit more in-depth uh, uh, analysts of them. Uh, expanding uh, influence and overlays and all that other kind of stuff, even outside of game. And uh, th there's one other thing coming in the new year. <laughs> I think it, I think it's the right time to to do it. All right, this is something I don't even know about, so teasers. Yeah! <laughs> Coming attractions. You heard it here, you heard it here folks. <laughs> um, one yeah, thing I... I, I, th I, think it's, I think it's the right time to bring it back, because I actually mentioned it earlier in the show, that the show's still going, about how the community is coming back. It's, it's, I use quaint terms like, it's nice and it's cute. Everyone's playing along with each other, and all the streamers don't want to kill each other like oh this is nice and cute um i i, I don't mean to be sarcastic or fun no it, it, it was legitimately almost intriguing to see how this community has come kind of full back full circle in a way and i want to kind of put a microphone to that dun, dun, dun. so <laughs> that'll be a project i'm um beginning to uh work on get things set up hopefully send us nice and delivers a few new things so awesome. that'll be a uh, that'll be something to look forward to in the new year. Common attractions. Yeah, I wanted to because uh, you probably have yours too, but I wanted to showcase this thing because I'm so 
proud of the fact that we got these awesome. So you guys remember that there was the uh, Necromancer print, but at the PAX East event, they gave us this little like gifty gift of this same print, which I can't put on screen all at once, but it's signed as well by all the like developers and stuff. And there are some signatures on there that you probably won't even be able to get anymore because most of those people have left or moved on to different teams and such. So, yeah, I would think so. I, I have my downstairs. I think Alyssa and I are going to pull the trigger in the new year. And even though there are some rooms that still aren't painted yet, I'm just going to start hanging up all my stuff and start unloading all the stuff in the room and just take over the bedroom. Nice. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, I guess that's probably a good point to wrap the show. So I'll go ahead and start doing all the normal outro stuff that Nineball does. So sorry if I flub any of this, but I usually just let him go and then I kind of tune out. <laughs> In any case, you can get a hold of us on email, like I was mentioning, westmarchworkshop at blizzpro.com. We want to hear from you guys. Help us wrap up your year and our year together. Let us know your favorite moments from seasons, favorite moments from the workshop. Favorite moments from real life. Whatever you got for us. Send in some missives. We want to read them. We want to hear them. Let's make the last episode all about the community. Uh, Twitter, of course, is the WM Workshop. Like I mentioned, if you love writing on Twitter, then send us a whole bunch of tweets. Thread them up. Do better than Donald Trump does. I know you can. Uh, the <laughs> live stream here. Twitch.tv slash BlizzPro. It's every other Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. That's where you can catch the show. So the next one will, of course, be the 27th. Uh, which, of course, is a few days before the year ends. So that's why we'll be doing all that year in review, recap, good stuff. There's also more shows that we have, of course, here on the channel. Uh, feel free to follow the channel and subscribe to the channel to help Blizz Pro grow as a thing, as a lovely unit and universal deliverance system of all the great Blizz Pro podcast offerings, such as Well Met, Heroes Power Hour, Payload, and we also have a World of Warcraft podcast, I believe that's still going, but it's not one that's mm -hmm. done live. So those are all the offerings that we've got. Those are on different nights and times that I don't have in front of me right now. But definitely, if you follow the channel, you'll be able to get notifications whenever they do go live. So more incentive to do so. Of course, we have our website, Diablo.BlizzPro.com, which as Dread was talking about, you know, took the reins, cracking the whip getting some fresh hot content on there as much as we possibly can so do make sure to get that in your bookmarks check in often hopefully we'll have some news as it comes out as it trickles out in the coming months uh, maybe we'll be able to hype some things up as we get some new infos fingers crossed uh, but definitely check there for any and all things diablo related and then of course in-game stuff blizz pro clan uh, right now, it's actually relatively full, but people are certainly going inactive. Like I was saying, the malaise is kind of hitting, the mid-season lull is hitting. So we will be freeing up some spots from the inactivity rule that we have. And if you want to get in, if you're really looking to group up with some people and you're finding all your friends are going back to Overwatch or just died off and lost their hardcore characters or something, come on over. Water's fine. We'll have space for you. And if you can't get into the clan or you just don't want to leave your clan, we of course have the West March Workshop community. And that is a lovely place to just gather and talk and post your items when you get that really sick primal. But usually it's when you get that really crappy primal and you want to share it and commiserate a little bit. Uh, feel free to get into the community there and interact with your fellow workshoppers. And that's pretty much it. We do have our Discord, of course, and that's where a lot of people will send messages to each other throughout the day. Uh, talk it up, chat it up when outside of game. Sometimes even when in game, you can hop into the voice channels. Dread and I and a few of our friends have been hopping in there whenever we're grouped up together. Feel free to come and crash it. Say some crazy word things. It's fine. We'll handle it. Handle it. And last but not least, the social medias. Personally, you can follow Nineball, who's not here tonight because, again, he's got his lovely holiday party. Wish him well. Send him a message. Maybe he'll reply to you drunk and you can get something funny out of him. Uh, at Nineball Gamer. Oh on twitter and then when he does stream if he ever streams again because his internet is 100 percent baked potato twitch.tv slash nine ball <laughs> check him out when he's live follow him and then myself it's leviathan d3 on twitter and twitch.tv slash leviathan 111 been doing my best to stick to my stream schedule as i can all throughout the weekend especially on the weekends and dread where can the people follow you and find you uh, for right now, people can just find me at Dreadsife on Twitter, and 
Yeah, that's where it is for now. I keep it simple. Keeping it simple. He's a man of few words. And I guess that's a good place to leave. No more words until uh, the last episode of the year. Beep, boop, beep, boop. We love you guys.